Bonjour. Welcome back, everyone. This is Derek Bartolucelli with Leslie Powers. This album, The Divide. Yes, again, my friends, uh, we got another topic on health because this is one of the things that is uh, paramount in <clears throat> just operating as a human being. And today, you know, things have just been more and more draconian. Over here in France, they're trying to pass laws of where we can't even uh, refuse certain medical treatments or uh, critique or complain about certain things that we suffered from those things or, you know, pharmaceuticals and that kind of stuff. So in the light of all the allopathic, um, whatever the hell is going on, you know, people like myself and Melissa and, and so many others have, you know, delved into alternatives like, you know, new German medicine, which is interesting because my mother is from there, you know, born in uh, Bavaria, but uh, I was born in California where Leslie was not, but she's living in NorCal and we got our guest Melissa in Southern California. So what's cracking? <laughs> Hi, Melissa. Welcome Hi, to guys. The, the Divide. Yeah. Hey. yeah, I'm really excited to have Melissa on um, our show today. She was part of the the last Freedom Under Law, Under Natural Law conference, doing um, an intro to some variation, some knowledge from the German New Medicine or New, is it New German or German New? Germanic <laughs> New Medicine. Germanic yeah. New Medicine. And so this is a very, um, pretty foreign concept of um, approaching health and medical intervention that I, I think is worth looking at, right? It's it's pretty much been um, held out of the mainstream view, and yet it seems to have a lot of potential and power. So, so Melissa, just share a little bit about yourself to start out with your background, and 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 then we'll go from there. Yeah, thank you guys for having me. I uh, my background is chiropractic, so I graduated chiropractic school in 2012, and everything about um, the way that I was working was about holistic health. So nutrition and exercise and detoxification and taking care of the spine and the nervous system. And that was um, my my whole world for many years and um, all throughout school. And I just believe so much um, in learning about chiropractic. The main philosophy, it's very rich in philosophy, the, the history of chiropractic, the developers and creators of chiropractic chiropractic had, wrote volumes and volumes of philosophy about innate intelligence, about how brilliant the body is and how the innate intelligence is the infinite intelligence of the universe working in the biological system. And so yeah. they, in the in these volumes of these philosophical books, they just would talk about how the body doesn't make mistakes. The body is the master chemist. The body knows exactly what's going on all of the time. And I was just so turned on by just knowing that my body knows what it's doing. My body knows how to turn food into living energy. It knows how to process everything that's happening. It built itself from scratch. And so that was my background. And what I was really just so you know in love with is just understanding this amazing innate intelligence, the brilliant ability the body has to heal and repair itself. And that when something seems to go awry, in, in chiropractic, the model is to look at the spine, look well to the spine for the cause of disease and looking at, you know, areas of misalignment in the spine as the reason that um, dis, dis ease. So dis ease meaning and, you know, no longer being in harmonious balance, that there's a disharmony in the balance. And so chiropractic, you know, looks at the spine and adjusting the spine, as well as the, you know, the nutrition and all of the physical things that were going on with the person. And my own journey kind of took me down a path of looking at the mind, looking at perception, looking at, because I, from the outside, did everything super healthy. If you followed me around for a day, you'd see me wake up and use, you know, holistic toothpaste and all these, you know, healthy skincare products and I'm exercising and I'm doing all of these healthy things and I only eat certain kinds of foods and I only, you know, drink certain kinds of water and it's like everything was very, very healthy externally, physically from the outside. But inside, there was Sunday night anxiety and picking fights with my partner and creating all sorts of drama. And so there were things that weren't physical. There were things that were internal, mental, spiritual stuff that was still going on, even though I did all the physically healthy things. And so, you know, it was really a journey within my relationship to improve these patterns of recurring, you know, 
problems that mm -hmm. caused me and my partner both to start look at what's going on in here, you know, because I would even see that in my, my patients that would come into the chiropractic office is that I'd give them this lifestyle prescription, do these things, don't do these things. And they'd see improvements and they definitely would, you know, improve and get better. But then, you know, they'd have these patterns, these things that would come up that just wasn't addressed by the physical type of work that I was doing. We needed to get more into what's going on back here 24 seven. Mm -hmm. And so we, we started teaching workshops in that nature. And so, and sort of, I kind of got away from that feeling like the most important thing I could do for people is tell them the exercises to do and the foods to eat and what not to eat. And then, so my partner and I, we were doing that for a while. And then one day I was actually listening to a podcast about magnesium supplementation because I was still teaching classes on that. And the woman who was being interviewed mentioned the words, like the, the, sub, the person interviewing her asked her about cancer. And she very briefly mentioned German New Medicine and then went on with her interview. So it wasn't about German New Medicine. It was just a name drop and then a carry on with the conversation. But I, at that point, had been in the holistic natural health world for a decade and I had never heard this. And I was like, what is this thing? And I looked it up and I was like, my, my mind was blown. I was immediately just like, Ooh, there is deep, 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 profound truth here. And I was absolutely floored that I've never heard about it before. And, you know, when I started, you know, just, you kind of just take it in. So here's the story. What's the story of German new medicine? So there's this guy, this medical doctor, and not just a medical doctor. He was a very um, accomplished medical doctor. He was the youngest licensed medical doctor um, in Germany of, at his time. He um, had several patents. He has a scalpel that he patented that was like super extra sharp for, you know, certain uh, plastic surgery type of a, um, applications and he had a bunch of different uh, patents and he was very passionate about you know creating these patents and that funded his ability to treat patients for free like he didn't want to charge the patients and so he made all these inventions patented all these things and made money from that and then he treated people you know, pro bono and just, you know, the mm -hmm. way that he felt in his heart, he wanted to, to treat patients. And then in 1978, he, his family experienced an extreme tragedy, which was his, his son and daughter were off on a, on a trip. Um, and this crazy thing happened. They're off on this island where the Italian crown prince of Savoy um, huh. was living. And there was a dispute and the prince kind of went crazy and he got in a dinghy and he uh, rode the dinghy over to this boat and he shot this gun and he missed the person he was kind of aiming for. And the shot went through, you know, the wall of the boat and hit Dirk Hammer. So Dr. Hammer's 17 year old son, who's just on this, you know, on this trip on this, in the sea with his, his sister and this big group. And, um, and it was not, you know, it didn't kill him right away. And so he was, you know, airlifted to the hospital and it was a huge, big dramatic thing. And he had his leg amputated and they're trying all these things to keep him alive. And ultimately he dies in his father's arms. And then after the, this tragic and shocking and political, I mean, it was dramatic and the prince is involved. And at first, there's actually a documentary on Netflix called The, uh, the King Who Never Was. Oh. And it's about this story. Um, it's not about Hammer, but it's specifically about this thing and how at first the prince admitted to it. And then he said he didn't do it and he didn't end up getting convicted for it. And so, you know, that was a whole big political battle in and of itself. Um, but as a result of this big dramatic thing that happened, Dr. Hammer, um, following the loss of his son, developed testicular cancer. You know, and he had already had a sense that there was a connection between, you know, traumatic emotional experiences and cancer. But now, whew, here it was in his own body, in his own experience. And so he uh, started to, you know, go with this idea. He was actually in Bavaria. Um, working as a as the head of an oncology unit, and he had the uh, opportunity to test this theory. And so every you know he'd go and ask every man with testicular cancer if they if he, they had a dramatic shocking event prior to their diagnosis. And it wasn't just a correlation where some of the time they had a tra traumatic shocking event. Every single time, wow, there was a traumatic shocking event of a specific nature, of a loss, the loss of a loved one. And so he found also that the, the correlate in women was an ovarian cancer, and they also experienced some type of loss, a loss of a child, a loss of a pet, a loss of a loved one. And so he's seeing that there's a theme, that there's a loss, and then there's a cancer in the testicles or the ovaries. And then 
when someone had colon cancer, there was some type of ugly situation in their life. That was the shock for them. Someone who had lung cancer had some type of a death fright shock. Um, mm -hmm. The women with glandular breast cancer had some type of worry. So he's seeing this theme, this pattern, this na nature's pattern starts mm -hmm. to emerge from these stories, from this connection between a specific type of trauma and a specific type of change in an organ, a cancer in an organ. And then he thought, you know, if something's happening in the emotions and the psyche of this person and also in their body, there's got to be something in the brain. And so he started looking at CT scans of the brain. And on the CT scan, he could see that in a very specific area of the brain, there were circles. There were these ring-shaped formations, these, this area of increased energy in the brain in a certain area that always, always correlated to the thing that happened to the person. There's wow. a spot specific area of the brain, and there's a specific type of tissue change in the organ, a specific type of cancer. And so he, this is just kind of emerging to him. And he's like, am I discovering the, the, the cause of cancer, this, this map for understanding? And he had a dream where his son came to him and was like, yes, geared, you're, you're figuring it out. You know, there's more to discover. And so he's getting these kind of uh, confirmations in his dream from his son who died. And, you know, he said, as he's having these realization, he just goes weak in the knees. He's like, could, could I really be discovering this thing that he goes on to call the iron rule of cancer that in order, and this is also the first biological laws, because he goes on to discover five biological laws, but it all starts with this first one, this connection between the shocking thing that happened of a specific nature that your biology, so it's not your conscious mind. You say, oh, I lost a child, and because you use those words to describe it, then your body activates a particular program. It is not conscious. This is subconscious. This is biological. This is the part of you that is uh, running all of your organs. It is the part of you that's digesting your food. The you don't think about that part. This is the, uh, the autonomic nervous system. This is the wow. part that just runs itself. And so that part registers this man lost his offspring. That's That was the primal, um, again, no language, just a primal experience of loss, of devastation of my, my offspring that I birthed into this world that grew to this point is now gone. And the biology registers exactly the tissue that needs to adapt in that moment. And it was the mm -hmm. testicles. And when you think about it, it actually makes a lot of sense. And that's one of the mm -hmm. things that you'll, you'll, when you study this work, you'll start saying, well, that makes a lot of sense. Well, that makes a lot of sense. And that's where, because mm -hmm. you, this is an empirical science, which means you with your own brain can observe your own experience and see this is how it works. That's the laws of nature. You see, this is how it works. And so that's what he saw is that you know, when you have this experience, your biology reads exactly the nature of the experience. And then it's almost like a button, like, like an activation of a program. It's an inborn biological adaptation that your body has the ability to help you. And the way the body can help is kind of limited, obviously to your physical tissues. It can either grow more cells. So you've got more cells to produce more of whatever that cell produces, or you can erode cells. And so if you have a duct, so let's say you've got a duct, you know, that has a, like the bile duct. And so we're putting bile uh, into the digestive system. There's a certain size that that duct is, but in an emergency, if you're having a territorial anger conflict, guess what? Your bile duct can go like this. It can widen. Isn't that cool that the biology has, again, it's limited in how it can help you. It can't, you know, get you out of the situation. It can't, you know, pay your debt. But what it can do is it can widen your bile duct or it can produce more um, cells in your tonsils so that you can produce more saliva. You can, so you can better swallow something down or spit something out. And so that's what we're working with here is this very particular, detailed, intelligent map for understanding how your physical tissues can turn on certain programs to change. It's like you're a transformer. And depending on what you're going through, the unresolved conflict in your life, your body transforms in a particular way for a period of time until you get out of that situation. And then when you get out of it, the body can set you back to normal. 
And it's like, whoa, isn't that amazing? And that's how he discovered, he, at first he thought this just applied to cancer, but then he found out it not only applies to cancer, it applies to a pimple, to a cold sore, to a sty in your eye, to an mm -hmm. ear infection, to a hemorrhoid. And he says, oh, every one of these tissue changes has a very specific reason for happening. And when you can identify what is it that happened in my life that turned on this program, and then you can understand yourself better, you can understand your biology better, and biggest of all, you don't have to be afraid of mm. your body. You don't have to be afraid of your health because the conventional idea is that something is going wrong. You know, that mm. there's a mistake, there's an error, there's a problem. Mm. Even in my mm -hmm. old model, I viewed disease as like kind of like punishment is like, well, you yeah. ate a bad diet all your life and you exposed yourself to a lot of toxins and you were really sedentary. And so your mm -hmm. immune system's bad and you've really abused yourself. And so, sorry, now you're kind of sick. And that's how I thought mm -hmm. of it. And so now we yeah. have to hurry up and clean up your diet and try to get you exercising. So hopefully we can reverse the damage that's been done. Yeah. But, but this model shows us that the body's been doing the right thing every step of the way to help you, which is like right. so wonderful. <laughs> yeah, this is a huge paradigm shift, right? Of Enormous. seeing a symptom as, you know, a problem, something to get to reverse, to get rid of. To, and, and what I'm kind of hearing is that the symptom is actually the body's wisdom in action, trying to reharmonize, I guess. Yeah, it's trying to support you. So again, if you lost right. your offspring, and the biology reads, wow, my offspring is gone. What is the biology mm -hmm. going to do? Let me enhance your ability to produce offspring. So the ovaries enhance or the testicles enhance. It's like mm -hmm. that makes biological sense. So the, the, the symptom and the thing we're seeing as cancer as something going wrong mm -hmm. in the body is the body's best attempt to support you to survive that situation. Mm -hmm. And because all of the biological programs are about survival for you right. first and foremost, and then reproduction, because that's how the game of life keeps going, survival and reproduction, that's the game. And so yeah. every program, every symptom you've ever had in your life, <laughs> we have to look at how has this supported my survival or mm -hmm. my ability to reproduce. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the problem comes in is if we've had these conflicts for years and years and years and years and years and years, and we haven't fully resolved them and we've been in and out living unnatural, Mm -hmm. unbiologically oriented lives. We're living, mm -hmm. you know, our, our whole biological makeup developed in a certain context. And now that context is extremely different. The, there's a degradation of our, our, our core sense of safety, you know, comes from the family. And when we destroy the family unit, when we, you know, pervert the, the way of nature, people Ha don't have that fundamental safety and that opens them up to tons and tons of conflict. So from the way that we birth, yeah, the trauma and all, that, yeah. all of that, it all has, you know, has everything to do with the state of health today mm -hmm. is people, they don't feel safe. They don't have a community. Yeah. They don't have, you know, support and, and family. They, everyone feels like they're on an Island and they're yeah. all, you know, bowing down to big daddy government. And it's like, it's mm -hmm. all messed up. Yeah, so fascinating. So as I, I'm a, a clinical social worker, and I do mental health work and have been um, studying and implementing the internal family systems model. And the idea is really that our symptoms are um, natural developments of our system to protect us mm -hmm. and to assist us and, you know, you know to mo modu modulate our um, physiology in a sense so that we're protected from the trauma, you know, and it's for survival. And so it seems almost like a, a parallel or a correspondence to this as well, that the symptom, which we might see as negative, just like if somebody has an anxiety attack, they could see it as negative, but really it's an attempt to help you. And really the way of working with that symptom is to embrace and, and um, ex understand its, its function and its sort of good intention. So the body seems to do something similar. And yet, like the symptoms can get overdone, like they can go extreme. So how does how do we approach that? From yeah, and that, that would mean that the conflict, and so it's never like the symptoms are always appropriate. So the, the symptom okay. is, you know, the body is, is a responder, it responds to the signals from the psyche, you know, which come mm -hmm. from 
how am I perceiving and experiencing my environment? You know, and so if they're, if the symptoms are extreme, that means that I was in an extreme conflict that went on for a very long time. And so, yes, you know, there's a time limit. And that's where if everyone knows this map, and that's one of the things that we've been deprived of because mm -hmm. this body of knowledge has been available. You know, Dr. Hammer discovered the iron rule of cancer in 1981. So we're over 40 mm -hmm. years now where this information has been known, but has been suppressed. And the thing is, yeah. is everyone should know this. Every single person, you should have known this your whole life. You should know mm -hmm. that a can't swallow conflict causes a sore throat. You should know that when you want to bite someone's head off and you hold back, that causes decay in your teeth. You should know that when something stinks to you, when you're annoyed, that's what causes your sinus infection. When you want to hear something, that's what causes your right ear to have an adaptation. You should know all of this. It should just be intuitive and innate that your whole life, your family, everybody you've ever known has talked about it in this way. Everyone should know that conflicting events, when there's unresolved problems in a family, in a relationship, um, that that there's there's people are experiencing conflicts. And so we want to, in you know, in Germany, in ancient Germany cultures, they used to have this thing called the thing, where every Tuesday everybody would come together and and talk it out. Like, let's have a context for resolving our conflicts, because if we don't and these things go on and on and on and on, that's how the, what we consider, you know, scary diseases. It's simply a conflict that's gone on for a very long time. And sometimes the, the biology cannot handle the amount of time it's gone on. It's just too much. There, there's a limitation of the tissue to adapt to that. And right. so sometimes, yes, do we die with these intentional adaptations that the body has intended for our survival? Yes, that's possible. And that's where, again, if we know this map, and we recognize it and we can resolve our conflicts in a timely manner, that's mm -hmm. how everyone, you know, can look at you, the, the cultures, what are they called? The blue zones or the places where mm -hmm. people live for hundreds of years. Yeah. It's like, what is the core? What are these societies like? You know, what, how do they handle conflict in the community? That's the thing to look at, not just their diet, not just their, you know, the, the physical stuff they put in their mouth. It's what is their, their emotional community like and how do they resolve conflicts? How how we stay wow longevity comes from being solved conflicts in a time yeah. yeah so so what i'm hearing is really important and this is like this deep in um integration or, or in interconnection between like body and mind, right? Body, mind, spirit, ultimately. And that are how we handle conflict as people, how we handle the feelings related to conflict, and then how we respond in community to interpersonal issues and conflict is really essential in a sense. It's one of the fundamental uh, skills for health, maintaining mm -hmm. health. Right. Absolutely. That's a fascinating. Yeah. And so um, and if someone, you know, because we're not we're not been taught this, you know, at young ages and and psychology, our understanding of psychology is not even really openly taught. And so we're ignorantly kind of just doing what we do and are through generations of just um, suppressing and and pushing down emotions and not facing conflicts and fighting and fleeing and freezing and fawning and all of those trauma responses. So what ultimately, you know, just in a summary of what does all of that create in a society, you know, in, you know, from an individual level outward? Yeah, well, it creates what we see today, you know, that, that inability to, you know, one, again, starting with with birth, starting with babies, starting with, you know, how did you learn to emotionally regulate and how did you learn from your environment? If you were separated from your mother at birth, you know, so many children are dealing with the, just that not having that foundational fundamental relationship between their mother and themselves that they are feeling on an island all alone. My mother is separated from me. So, you know, what they do in a, in a hospital birth setting, it, it sets a child up for not feeling secure their entire life because their very first moments in this world where the, their only home they've ever known, the heartbeat, like the, the child being near and up against the heartbeat of the mother, even something like an ultrasound can interrupt and create a conflict in the womb because the ultrasound is 
you know, it's sound. And so it blocks, it can block out the sound of the mother's heartbeat. And if that has been wow. like your compass in life, the, the one thing here you are floating, you know, you're floating in this amniotic sac, you're in this just kind of oceanic experience and you've got this boom, 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 boom. And then some sound mm. comes in and interrupts that. That can be <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, so major interference. Whoa, what's going on? This is scary. You know, like they'll say, oh, how cute. They're trying to, you know, touch the, they're like trying to block this sound out. And we're like, you know, looking at it like this, this wonderful thing. And it's like, you know, even something that can be well-meaning, well-intentioned. Oh, I just want to check this. I just want to see this, you know, can, because it's a divorce from nature. You know, and it is something that in nature isn't done. And so anything that we do that kind of interrupts how our bodies um, have developed up until this point can offer us a po you know, possibility of having a conflict. And so, you know, ultrasounds, separating mothers and babies after the birth, washing the baby. Sonogram, right does that count too? That's an that? ultrasound. Sonogram. Oh, that is. Are, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that yeah. kind of reminds me of, you know, submarines in the ocean of all the sea life over there, like boats and all that shit, you know? Yeah. Totally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's like, okay, how does this interrupt what is normal, biological and natural and, and set someone up for feeling separated, feeling isolated, feeling alone, um, you know, and then, you know, little children uh, is the mother home with the child. You know, is she breastfeeding? Is the child getting the the milk morsel of, that they but the, that they desire? Are they given a bottle? You know, if a child develops thrush, you know, so white spots in the mouth, it's often because they want the breast, but they're given a substitute. They're given a plastic nipple. They're given a you know a, something that's not mom because mom's got to get off to work or she has to you know leave for mm -hmm. some reason because she is forgetting that her most important role is in in the in the, allowing this child to have this secure um, relationship to its its world. And so when the child doesn't have that, you know, it, it opens up the door for more and more conflicts. And so that's kind of, you know, the, the modern world and the types of conflicts and, you know, how people more and more you hear about neurodivergence. You know, so people who are either on the autism spectrum have ADD, ADHD, and that's kind of a big theme you'll see even on social media is like, oh, I'm neurodivergent or I'm weird in this way. All of that weirdness comes from early childhood trauma, early separation conflicts, early feeling stuck conflicts, early territorial anger conflicts and scare fright conflicts. And Dr. Hammer, so this is another really amazing thing he discovered is that so the certain areas of the brain if you have a conflict here and a conflict on the opposite side of the brain at the same time the behavior will change and so this is where mental health issues come from specific combinations of conflict you know mm -hmm. so if you mix red uh, and blue together you get purple and so when you get you know when you mix this conflict with this conflict you get autism when you mix this conflict right. with this conflict you get anorexia when you mix this you know and so depending on how you mix the conflicts together in the brain that determines the kind of quirks and weirdness and um diversions from normal that a person will experience. It explains sexuality. It explains, you know, who you're attracted to. It explains if you, you know, don't feel like you identify with your own physical body because of specific types of trauma. And so the understanding of this map is so incredible because when you see that you can work to, you know, do your best as you can to try to resolve certain things, but more than anything moving forward, because a lot of the conflicts of our childhood, you know, you can't really resolve them now because kind of the, in a sense that we've made that, that program has already been opened on your mental computer. Mm -hmm. And because you've kind of lived so many years with it, that a lot of these things we do have to just learn to navigate, which we don't have to see as a bad thing. You know, mm -hmm. that's the beauty of the, the psychic mm -hmm. system and the evolutionary mm -hmm. capacity of mm -hmm. consciousness is that we can use it all. We can use yeah. traumatic things. The biology adapts in certain ways. These constellations um, are actually superpowers. They're the brain's ability to adapt. Let me, let me try to find a way out of this, you know, you know, it's, we live in an alternate reality. And so that's what you see is when people are highly constellated as it's called. So that's, you've got a lot of these conflicts on multiple sides of on the opposite sides of your brain. Mm -hmm. You live in a different reality. You're not living in kind of the, the same world as everyone else. And so that's what we see. We see generations that just seem to be living, you know, wow. in completely different worlds. It's because they had completely different childhood traumas and shocks that led to different constellation combinations. And so, 
again, through understanding this, we can do our best to circle back to biological right. normal because that gives us the best chance at a healthy, you know, and healthy, what does healthy mean? Healthy means able to reproduce. And we see in many cases, people are not able or interested in reproducing because of these conflicts and these constellations that they're emotionally frozen. When you have a constellation, you get emotionally frozen at that age. And so today we have most people are emotionally frozen at the age of five, you know, and they're living, you know, adult lives, but they emotionally only are responding as a five-year-old because that's when their traumas, that's when their constellation yeah. came to be. And so yeah. by, yeah, we by speak kind a lot of about shadow work and that kind of stuff, you know, on our show. Yeah. yeah. And what you're really saying is that it could even or... be occurring in utero too. Absolutely. Like, and that's yeah. ignored a lot. That's not often considered the, the kind of conflicts and, and um, traumas to the system of a, of a in fetus. Yeah. It's the implications are huge, what you're saying, you know, in on the lifestyle, on our lifestyle choices, right? And how many and, lifestyle choices yeah. are compounding all these issues right there? Yeah. Even just like talking about pharmaceuticals, we're talking about, you know, legal substances that are prescribed to people that have these mm -hmm. ADHD, whatever the fuck's, and it's just mm -hmm. making their situation that much fucking worse. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. people just don't know better. They trust into the systems. We trust our fucking experts and all that jazz. And yeah. how many people have been, you know, nipped in the butt by that crap? Yeah. You know, just I, even lifestyle. I gotta hold my tongue because, you know, I yeah. got personal issues with that. Cause yeah. Well, yeah, it's, it's huge. Thing. Right. You know, just like, like you were talking about ultrasounds, you know, in for, for babies and you are like, why, why, you know, there's not, it's just treated as if there's no negative consequences at all or impact on that baby or the standard practices of like, you know, mothers going back to work, you know, after two and a half or three months. And, you know, there's so many aspects of our, of our lifestyle that are, working against the, the natural process of our bodies. And I think, you know, ultimately these things are traceable and that's, what's really important about this model. It's not just random mm. that, that these symptoms and these things that are happening, they're traceable. And I can see that in the mental health field. And I think that this kind of bio, biological um, information is just so powerful and reinforces and interconnects with all of that. And, and it does um, ultimately lead to us, you know, like our living as, as a, a, in a slave system, ultimately, where our choices are being thwarted to live in the most healthy ways. Um, so th I just want to say that, you know, it's huge. And, and so you're talking about, um, there's two topics that I want to make sure we cover. And one is that, that why, you know, well, let's talk about the healing first. So what, you know, as you said, that, that we have accumulation over time and years of um, these unresolved conflicts and rep repetitive conflicts. And so that there's a toll that it takes in our bodies and our bodies, like a, a storybook, almost like expressing our symptoms are an expression and telling us something. So how do we learn to read our bodies, our symptoms, and then uh, how do we work towards healing or recovering from those early injuries? Yes. And that actually, the, the third biological law is this compass. It's the ontogenetic mm -hmm. system of the tissues of our body. And so this is how you're going to become, you know, Sherlock Holmes, a detective who can figure out, mm -hmm. you know, what does this symptom tell me about my, mm -hmm. my conflict? And so there's uh, three different tissue types that all of your entire body is woven together out of these three different tissue types. Functionally, it's four different tissue types. We have the endoderm, the mesoderm, and the ectoderm. And the mesoderm is chunked into old and new. And so these tissues, they operate in a certain way. And when you're like, ooh, what's the symptom that I have? You always have to go back to what's the tissue type of that organ? You know, so I already men mentioned the tonsils. So the tonsils belong to this yellow group. And the yellow group is the old brain. And the old brain, so this is the most primitive, ancient part of our biology. And so you think about the most, it performs the most simple functions of digestion, respiration, reproduction. So basic living, you're not worried about your community, you're not worried about your self-value. All you're worried about is 
taking nutrients in, taking oxygen in, expelling the waste and reproducing again. Basic, basic. That's the endoderm. And this is going to be the glandular tissues of the body. So anything that has to do with processing a morsel. And so a morsel is something you'll hear a lot in, in German New Medicine. And a morsel is something that you need to survive. So the most basic morsel is like a food morsel, the milk morsel. I want to take this in and then I need to process it out. And so these tissues, when you have a conflict about a morsel, the tissue will grow bigger. And so that we grow this tissue larger during the conflict. So the tonsils will grow or the, the salivary glands will grow or the lung um, alveoli will grow. So these are all organs that either produce juices or they absorb something. So either they're producing saliva, they're producing digestive juices, or they're absorbing um, oxygen or they're absorbing nutrients. And when this group has a conflict, we have more tissue so that we can better perform that task. So the tonsils can produce more saliva so we can better swallow something down or spit it out. The lungs produce more of this alveoli so we can better absorb oxygen. So if you have an, an indigestible morsel conflict in your gut, so if you're dealing with uh, diarrhea, if you're dealing with um, you know blood and mucus in your stool, you had an indigestible morsel conflict, your intestines produced more juices. So there was a growth of either a flat growing or a, a cauliflower growing growth in your colon to produce more juices or to better absorb the nutrients. And then when you heal that conflict, the body breaks it down. And so that's the morsel conflict. Then we have the next layer is the deep Skin. And so this is the dermis, this is the pleura, the pericardium, this is controlled from the cerebellum. And so if you have a pimple or if you have um, a spot like a mole or like a melanoma, it comes from this mm -hmm. old mesodermal layer and it's about integrity, feeling attacked, feeling soiled, feeling defiled is what the theme of that organ group is. And so you, you look, okay, so the tonsils are swollen. All right. So I had a morsel conflict. Oh, I've got a, you know, a, a brown, big brown mole or freckle or melanoma on my arm. Okay. I felt attacked or I felt soiled. That's how you will start to decode this. You look at the symptom, you look at what mm -hmm. tissue does this come from, and that tells you the story of what conflict you experienced. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then having this added knowledge or the resource to go and study, right, to do this decoding is yeah, important. So there's some kind of map or correlative, uh, you know, parts of the body towards ailments and maladies and all that jazz, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yep. So the so muscular I'm sure skill people who have medical degrees would listen to this and be like, what the hell is this unicorn shit? <laughs> they know they don't learn this stuff they don't learn natural law they don't learn uh psychology they don't understand the gut brain connection and a lot of dietary things that account for so much of our health that you know maintains and yes like if we're going to be speaking about that hermetically sealed health it all goes back to your state of mind the first mm -hmm. cosmic principle of mentalism and what have they done to us over and over and over through any kind of propaganda through so much uh commercial of Okay, like, oh, like the fear-based uh, mind control type of stuff, like you needed to do this, otherwise you could get sick or, you know, all this stuff and don't want to get grandma killed and whatever the hell. And have you noticed that you're familiar with the term egregore? I have heard it, but remind About, me. Yeah, it's like, a, you know, it's more of uh, an idea that can, you know, have more and more people, you know, grasp onto this idea and live it out. And it becomes a, you know, a manifestation in and of itself and like kind of like a pendulum mm -hmm. that's swinging to whatever side it could be negative or positive, you know, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah, just like in the collective consciousness or unconsciousness, we have, you know, so much fear going on. And for me, like putting that into perspective of this, you know, new German medicine model, you can see how much, you know, disease and, and ailments are just manifested from the collective from other people sometimes, just them projecting their shadow and their fear upon others. And, you know, especially since the dawning of the Rona, a la COVID-19, what have we seen? Of Literally, how many people have, you know, like crossed the sidewalk because there's someone in coming from the other direction, whether or not they were wearing a mask or whatever. It's like we lost humanity. You know, people lost that, you know, that true heart-based intelligence right then and there, right. it seems. And the divisions became 
broader, you know, more wide, right? And so these conflicts aren't being uh, resolved. So, you know, there's implications to all of that from this model as well. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And then, like yeah. you said about the, you know, other people. So, you know, the uh, what was considered, you know, COVID, schmovid, it, what it is, is a territorial fear conflict, which belongs mm. to the red group and it affects the bronchial mucosa. And so if I'm afraid, if I'm afraid in my territory, if I'm afraid of you, if I'm afraid of you not wearing a mask, if I'm afraid of a doorknob that could have germs on it, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling this fear in my territory, which ignites an adaptation in the body of widening the bronchial tube. Mm. So again, if I'm afraid, my body's like, I need to get out of this danger. And when you're in danger, what do you need? You need oxygen. You need to breathe in more oxygen. So the bronchial tube, if it's normally like this, when you have a territorial fear conflict, because the news told you to be afraid of hugging your grandma, and that your, you know, your neighbor could have a deadly illness. You're when you're walking down your hallway at your apartment, your bronchial tube is widening, so you can better get more oxygen in, and when to get out of this scary, uncertain situation. And then when you're safe in your, you know, in your sanitized apartment, you say, "Oh, what a relief." And so what happens is during the healing phase, and so that's what most people mistake. And this goes to the second biological law. Mm -hmm is most of the time when we have symptoms, when I'm coughing, when I have a fever, when I have a headache, when I'm aching, most people think, oh, this is when I'm having a problem. This is when the germ has taken over. This is when something mm. bad is happening in my body. But what's actually happening is the repair phase. So remember, something happens during the conflict. I can't swallow something. I'm afraid in my territory. I, uh, I'm feeling attacked. So when that's happening, the tissues are changing. So remember, either the tissues are growing, we're either growing extra cells because I'm feeling attacked and my, my uh, dermis skin is pre creating a little shield, a little melanoma to protect me from this attack. Or it is, you know, if I'm feeling afraid in my territory, my bronchial mucosa is widening. And so now I've got an extra growth here. I've got extra mm -hmm. tissue here and I've got a widened um, bronchial tube here. But then when I resolve the conflict, when, ooh, I'm out, I'm, a, I'm out of this danger, I'm away from that potential threat, I'm safe in my home, oh, I'm relaxed again, what happens is the body starts to repair whatever adaptation happens. So if I grew mm -hmm. extra cells mm -hmm. to protect or to produce more juices, now the body starts to break those cells down. Or if I widened a tube, I now have to put that tube back to normal. Mm. And when I, when, when the body puts the tube back to normal, <clears throat> that's when I cough. It's because I, there's a construction site in my lungs because I was in a conflict and the tube wow. widened. And now I'm in healing and the tube is repairing and there's mucus involved, you know, and there's heat because the body when you're in this warm phase, you know, this is when you're feverish. This is when you're coughing. This is what they called, you know, a, a deadly disease. No, it's not. It's simply the tissues are repairing after you were in the conflict. If you were in the conflict for a long time and the conflict was super intense and now you're in healing, the coughing's going to be more intense and you're going to be more fatigued. And so it all depends on the conflict you were experiencing. Now, one of the crazy things that they did with the whole, you know, scamdemic is get people so afraid. And then what did they do? So a person, let's say you're feverish, you're coughing, you spit on a test and it says, oh, you've got the scary thing. What did they do to people? Isolate. Well, isolate them, lock them up. And so in isolation mm -hmm. conflict, we go back to the yellow group. When you feel isolated, when you feel all alone, think about a little fish in the water <laughs> that washes up on shore that mm -hmm. is all alone out of its normal environment, it's isolated, it will hold on to water. And we have that same ancient biological programming in us. And so when you feel isolated and all alone, your kidneys close the collecting tubules. They build extra cells. So we build like a little dam in the kidneys. So fluid can't go out. And so we're holding on to fluid. And if you're coughing, so if you're in the healing phase, because you had a territorial fear conflict, your bronchial tube opened up and now it's in the repair phase. If you get isolated and you start holding onto water, that mm -hmm. water goes to whichever area in the body that is in healing. And so in the case of the lung, that fluid goes to the lung and it makes it much harder for you to breathe. And then we say, oh mm -hmm. no, this is especially aggressive. But what we did was put you in quarantine, in isolation. You can't see your family. You can't go home for Christmas. You can't do all of these things. You have a deadly scary disease that we're talking about. You're terrified. 
You're away from everyone you know and love. You're locked up in a room. You don't know when you're going to get to leave. You think you've got a scary thing going on. And then we say, oh, they, they died of, of the, the fake bug. Mm -hmm. And it's like, this is devastating. I mean, what was yeah. done was absolutely criminal. Horrific. I mean, a horrific experience. I know people who, you know, had conflicts because their loved ones died under such conditions. Mm -hmm. And now they've got additional conflicts. You can see how it's just, if we don't recognize what we're doing, mm -hmm. what our bodies are doing and how this map, how mm -hmm. this, bio, this is our biological code. This is always present all of the time, whether you believe it, whether you acknowledge it, whether you recognize it or not. This is how it always works. And it's it terribly unfortunate. Like you said, the conventional doctors are not taught this map. Conventional doctors have a wonderful place. They are mechanics. Mm -hmm. they, they help with mechanical problems, you know, and so they are very helpful if, let's say, you had an adaptation and a tumor has grown really large and now it's blocking your colon. They're wonderful. It's so amazing. We have skilled professionals who know the body so much that they can, you know, give you some type of drug and cut you open and take something out, sew you back together. That is an amazing miracle of medicine. Mm -hmm. However, they cannot tell you why that tumor is there. They cannot tell you what it's doing there, what its purpose is. They say, oh, something's wrong with you. And I just need to cut it out. And so they, if we could keep everyone, if we understood the role, everyone would be able to operate within it. But right. we wouldn't do as much management with medication because instead of medicating a person, we'd say, what was your conflict? Let's resolve that conflict. Mm -hmm. You know, but that's another reason that this information has been suppressed because it's very disruptive to our current paradigm, our current medical, you know, pharmaceutical complex that kind of controls one. everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. There's a lot of... Um, Imp there'd be a lot of impact on people's financial profits if um, people were to learn that the power really is in resolving the conflicts and not taking their medicines, you know? And um, so there's like this, this compounding of conflicts, right? Where a lot of times the prescription is further compounding the problem and adding more problems and making it more complex. So, so this assessment piece of like, tracing the symptoms, understanding the biological like response and effort to um, protect and heal. That's really most important. It seems like taking that time. And then when you identify conflicts and you s somehow kind of sort it out like that Sherlock Holmes, you know, then what, you know, the, what's the ad adaptive capacity of our body to to shift or reverse, you know, like, cause people are scared at those points, you know, very frightened. And that fear will then lead to just relying on a, a medical provider. But, but you're describing like a whole different treatment plan. What might that look like? Yeah. yeah so this is, you know, and it's, and it all depends on the individual cause it's tough. It's mm -hmm. actually super tough to be an adult mm -hmm. who's lived for 30, 40, 50, 60, mm -hmm. 70 years, believing that, this is a bad thing, that my body's doing something wrong, that this is a mistake mm -hmm. that I need to have cut out or b burned out, or I need to like, you know, nearly poison myself to death to get rid of this thing. And so mm -hmm. unfortunately, at, there are points at which, you know, even if you conceptually understand German mm -hmm. New Medicine and the five biological laws, your actual practical ability to activate and apply the tools in your life, it's limited by that the deep, deep, I mean, even myself, I, I teach this, I, I live this, I, but, you know, like the, the deep program fears of being a, an eight-year-old who's you know, grandma, you know, when I was three, my grandma died of breast, of breast cancer. Actually, mm -hmm. what did she die of? What's on her death certificate? Mm -hmm. Radiation poisoning, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I, I've had, you know, the, the, the deep programming came, what, I didn't find it until I was almost 30 when I came across this information. So it's like, you know, I have 30 years of other programming that's, that's fear-based. And that is like mm -hmm. what is built the foundation of my belief system. And so I'm, yeah. you know, I've been reprogramming myself for decades now, but there's still, it's like, you know, so that is, it does get difficult. Let's say that you're coming across German new medicine for the first time and you're like, I have a diagnosis or I have multiple diagnoses. How, how can I use this to heal? You know, um, we can, you can do your best to understand it, to connect the dots. I never say that there's, you know, there's no hope, but, but there are, you know, just realize that we are limited and that's why we have to start thinking about future generations. So for a person, let's say that you've got a chronic rash. 
So a chronic mm -hmm. rash, psoriasis or eczema means you have a separation conflict so that you, so think about the skin. What does the skin do? The skin, you know, it belongs to this red group, which is about community. It's about connection. It's about being yeah. held and touched and, you know, mm -hmm. supported and connected and seen. And when you have that torn away from you, you know, and one of the most primary separations is before from the mother, you know, so when you're separated from your mother, so when a little tiny little baby mom's like, I'm going back to work now, you know, cause that's what society says that mom's, you know, I, I'm an independent woman and I, you know, I work too. And this is, I can be a mom and have, you know, my job and that's fine. And so she hands her baby to someone the baby's never smelled before someone the baby's never touched before. And, and the baby is like, existentially terrified. And so the baby can develop a rash, you know, on their elbows, the backs of their knees. Where do I contact my mother, their whole face, their whole belt? I'm used to touching my mother here and she's been torn away from me. So a lot of times these mm -hmm. symptoms go all the way back to childhood. And so if someone let's say, mm -hmm. you know, they have a, a, an alert, an allergy to dairy. And so every time they have dairy, they break out in a rash. And it's like, you were given dairy as a substitute for your mother. And so it's not the dairy mm. that's causing your problem. It's that you were given the dairy as a substitute for mom. And so now every time you have the dairy, the body remembers being torn away from mom. And so that is where even just making oh, wow. that connection. A young man I interviewed on my YouTube channel where he made this connection. He realized he he called after he learned German new medicine. He's like, oh, you know, I get this, these rashes, this eczema. And it's like, you know, and dairy and all of this. And he calls up his mom. He's like, mom, how soon after I was born did you like go back to work? And it was like a week or like it was like two. It was very, it was a very short period of time. And he was like, and he, mm -hmm. and he had this moment where he realized, wow, my biology still remembers that still remembers being separated from my mom, like when I was just brand new in the world. Mm -hmm. And so by making that connection, he was able to reduce the symptoms by like 95% or something. He still had a few, these are called tracks. And so there's tracks that remind the body of a previous experience. And so every time you eat, you know, you drink the milk that you, your biology is remembering, remember that time you were separated, we better activate this biological adaptation program. And so that's where, you know, you, you try to connect the dots. Sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes people do get a little frustrated because these conflicts are old. They happened a long, long time ago. And part of especially separation conflicts with this red group is memory loss. And so because your, your psyche mm -hmm. is trying to help you is to not remember the person you're feeling separated yeah. from. Let me suppress, let me not remember this. And so there's that element to contend with too, is the, you know, memory loss that comes with separation conflicts because we don't want to acknowledge, we don't want to see it. Wow. Yeah. So profound. And it really does, um, support the importance of the psychological work, right? The trauma work, the mental health, you know, you know, going back and, and um, processing past traumas. So you could work maybe with from the psychological aspect and it may help clear and resolve the physical as well, right? Yes, and you really so want to, that, that would be, and it would be beautiful if people who do, uh, you know, shadow work and psychology, you know, the thing though is that, you know, psychology misses the, the, the deep biological meaning. And so if we can yeah. bring that in, and that's why I encourage everyone who does any type of professional people helping work in any regard, you have to learn this map because this map is going to give you laser tools to help your client, help your person that you're working with to get to the root of this from a biological perspective. Because people can, you know, be, you know, do some type of therapy, but if we're not like looking at how did my biology perceive this we're missing the biological component and so we can um you know by using this we can bridge the world we can use the tools that we've developed in one realm but we have to bring it into the biological so we can see this the bi body is doing this for a reason and i just need to figure out how can i resolve and so that's the thing a conflict how do you resolve a conflict you mm -hmm. have to find a biological solution you know so that's like if if someone has a, a miscarriage or they lose their a child nature says a new child, because that is, it, that's nature's way of resolving a conflict is something very natural. You know, if you are constantly at a job where you're always in a territorial conflict, you're always in a, a pissing match. So something that is, you know, these words we use are very interesting. Right. I wanted to bite his head off. I can't stomach it. Um, you know, it felt like 
you know, a lightning bolt. These, these, you know, the words that we use describe these biological conflict experiences. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. if you're in a pissing match at your work, you're always having a territorial marking conflict. So let's think about mm -hmm. this one. Here's another. Mm -hmm. So a person who has chronic urinary tract issues. Um, and so I've got, you know, inflammation and my, my, you know, my urinary tract is all inflamed. I, you know, so the old model is the idea that bad bacteria because of poor hygiene or a poor immune system, bad bacteria crawled up your urethra and is causing all this inflammation and all of these problems. But what's actually happening is you needed to mark your territory. So let's think biological, let's think nature, let's think animals in the wild. So if you are a wolf, if you, you know, are trying to mark your territory and there's someone that is, you know, impeding your territory, that's crossing your boundaries, kind of coming up over into your space, you know, looking at your women, it's like, the, what is the biology says, I need to be better able to mark my territory. And so the urethra Remember, we can either grow tissue or erode, and the urethra is a tube, and so it belongs to the red group, so it widens. So the urethra, the mucosa can widen. So if I've got a wider urethra and you've got a skinnier one, I'm going to be better able to mark my territory. And so in nature, this makes all the difference in the world. If I can pee more and put more of my scent on this area, I'm going to be better able to protect my space. But for the modern, you know, human correlation to that, I am at a job where, you know, someone's always trying to take my ideas. Somebody's always trying to, you know, get in on, you know, my success and they're kind of butting. And so I'm chronically in this territorial pissing match with all of these people. I have to get out of that environment because that is not good for me. I, I This is not an environment that's conducive to me having an intact urethra because I'm going to be widening and then I get off on the weekend and then what happens? Everything has to heal and it widens again when I'm back at work on Monday morning and then it has to heal. And so I'm going through this chronic adaptation, probably taking tons of antibiotics because that's all that medicine has to offer you is they say, oh, you know, it's the bacteria, you know, have better hygiene, but it's not about hygiene. It's about this marking your territory conflict that is unresolved. You know, right. and so this also happens with with women. If there's jealousy in the relationship, if she thinks some man or some woman is trying to get her, she can have a territory marking conflict about that. And so that and this is the interesting thing, you know, they, they say that, oh, women, you know, you need to pee after sex because if you don't, you're going to get a urinary tract infection. But think about it when when a, a woman has been away from her man, she needs to mark her territory. And so that can cause a resolution of a territory marking conflict when the couple comes together in union. Right. And so oh. the things we see, it's like, oh, when you see it through the biological lens and this map mm -hmm. and the tissue, it's like the depth of understanding of why this is happening just becomes so clear and so fascinating. Wow. It's like this intelligence that's in, in born in the body, in the biology. Mm -hmm. And I like yeah. what you said. Uh, I mean, you speak about this in, you know, many other videos and we got some questions we'd like to ask you more tailor made towards, you know, bridging the gaps on, you know, what's going on with, you know, like we have the allopathic side and the homeopathic side and a lot of people confused in the middle. They're obviously being coerced to be more allopathic than anything. But uh, I, I love what you said about <clears throat> how our bodies are nuanced. And this is something that, you know, is just not really acknowledged or taught much in the medical, educational, institutional academia, which, you know, it, it's a shame because, you know, yeah, uh, going into the psyche, the shadow work, the inner work, uh, you know, anything that has to do with, you know, even going across the meridians, I'm sure you've, you know, studied this and your chiropractic work and this and that, and like, you have like just a sore neck and that, what does that, you know, correspond to emotionally or what's going on in your life, your thought process and all that jazz. But, um, as far as, so how would you be able to give like your elevator pitch in a sense, or just, you know, you're talking to someone just like randomly, like, Oh, you, you understand the, the environment, the situation you're only, only going to speak with this person for like a minute. And they bring up something like, oh, you know, the whole medical, let's just say hypothetically, I don't know if you have actually had this, but uh, as far as, you know, because <clears throat> people listening to this, you know, y'all can do your research on your own. I'm talking about, you know, the difference between the allopathic versus homeopathic. 
it's really, you know, the pasteurized medical version of looking at things through that lens and that bias versus, you know, Edouard Béchamp in the terrain theory, which seems to be much more correspondent to the new German medicine than anything that I can really put my finger on, you know, as far as, you know, what's out there with the medical teachings and stuff. And for folks that, that don't understand, like, the germ theory and how, like, this whole contagion myth, as, as opposed to just, like, understanding the local environment within ourselves and the exterior environment and how that correlates to whatever, you know, current present situation in that moment and how someone got sick or infected or, or whatever the hell, right? Yeah. So, like, the, the allopathic system is seeing that something's wrong with the body, you know, so that some, there's some error that we need to come in from the outside and fix. It's an outside in system. Whereas like the vitalistic uh, model, it comes from the inside out. And so we're looking at what has gone on inside that makes this make sense, you know? And so the allopathic says, oh, well, there's germs, there's genes, there's, you know, random chance things can just screw up. And so we need to come in and we need to fix it. But the, when you're looking at it from this holistic vitalistic model that says there's innate intelligence, there's, there's wisdom in everything that nature does. And that's when we get to the fifth biological law, it's the quintessence. And so it's this understanding that nature only does what makes sense. There's nothing meaningless in nature. So, you know, an example would be that there's, you know, people who go and study plants, you know, they, they just like go and they look and they see all these plants. There is, um, there was a flower that had a very, very long, so like the part, so where the flower came out, it was very, very long from the, the top to the bottom. And they're like, there has to be, you know, an animal. And they, they looked forever and they couldn't find this animal. And finally, one day they see this, like, uh, this animal that's able to put its, uh, like, a, like a hummingbird with an extra, extra long um, snout, you know, an extra long beak rather, that can get down in there. And it's like, this everything in nature has its counterpart. It has its reason. It has the way, the intelligent way that it developed. And so nothing in nature makes a mistake. Nature has its own rhythm. You know, it's not a mistake for the fox to eat a rabbit. It's part of the natural order. It's part of the, the biological harmony of life. And so when a tumor pops up on a body, there's a tumor here. You know, the allopathic world says it's bad. Get it out, cut it out, burn it out, do whatever you can. This is something that is a mistake. We need to get rid of it. You know, it could be a gene. It could be, you know, so we don't know why it's here. And even just if you want to do a little experiment, go and just Google what causes cervical cancer, what causes lung cancer, what causes this and that. They'll say, we don't know. Again and again, you'll see, we don't really know. Could be this, could be that, could be this, could be that. But this system, this is a, these are biological laws, which mean they're consistent in every case. And so the fifth biological law says nothing in nature is meaningless. Nothing is malignant or diseased. It has a purpose. It has a reason. And so when you look at a tumor in the colon, in the lung, in the liver, you say, what does this tissue do? The colon, it digests, it breaks down, it absorbs. And so there must have been a conflict in this person of something they couldn't digest, break down, absorb. What does the liver do? It absorbs nutrients. Okay, if a person was feeling deprived of nutrients, so a starvation conflict is what affects the liver. And so when we look that this has deep meaning, um, it was funny. I, I posted something to Instagram recently and this, you know, someone, I'm pretty sure it was just like a bot. Like, so every, ever so often there'll be these just like people, I'm like, you, how, you're not even a, you can't be a real person the way that you're communicating. And, uh, yeah, I think one of them was like, you're a chiropractor, just stop. And I'm like, okay, yeah, this is like red flag all over it. But she said something like, um, oh, it's not that deep. So I'm basically, I'm explaining how when you devalue yourself, it causes your musculoskeletal system to adapt. So if you have aches and pains, this was really, you know, mind blowing for me to learn as a chiropractor. So neck pain, it's an intellectual or injustice self devaluation. I feel not smart enough. I'm beating up on myself. I'm feeling stupid. That causes the neck and skull bone tissue to adapt or the musculature. And so it has to do with a experience that I'm having. And this lady goes, oh, well, it's not that deep. And it's like, it's not that deep because you're not, you're not that deep. <laughs> you're not seeing, you're not able to comprehend. The complexity depends on your level of comprehension. You can say, ah, oh, everything's just random and, you know, stuff just happens for no reason. And that comes from a worldview, a model of, of random chance and, you know, oops, you know, oh, here's a universe. <laughs> and, and it's not understanding that there's intelligence and, you know, the body 
is consciousness that has formed into this living tissue. It's, it's concentrated consciousness is what our biological, mm. everything in this world is, uh, is how, this is how mother nature wants it to be. This is how the universe is expressing its lim unlimited intelligence. It has said, let's do it this way. And then evolution is causing us to adapt to the way things are. And so it's this beautiful, yeah. intricate system that, but if you don't have eyes to see it, it just seems like, well, it's not that deep, but yeah, you know, eyes to see it, you know, it's that much, it's deeper than you could possibly imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Everything is pretty deep. And there's almost a conspiracy in our world today for people to not be deep, <laughs> you know, like I think there, that there's um, the social engineers of the world would rather people not think deeply or understand their their body deeply. They, that's why there's all this superficial entertainment, you know, mm. and and I think, you know, um, you, you're you talking about the intelligence of nature. I believe that you have familiarity with the concepts of natural law and Mark Passio's work. And I'm wondering how you integrate um, your understanding of biological um, laws with those uh, spiritual laws talked about in uh, related to morality. Oh, I mean, when especially when you look at the laws of nature, so the law of correspondence, the laws of rhythm, everything can be seen in the biological laws. And so that's why it's completely consistent with understanding natural law and the natural order of the universe and the world and the way that here we have found ourselves within this, this system that works in a certain way. You know, so the principle of polarity. So you look at the law of, of two phases. We have the hot phase, we have the cold phase. We have the conflict phase, we have the healing phase. And so it's like, oh, there we see a universal principle exhibited in the five biological laws. You see the, the principle of vibration. And so when you have a conflict, so everything's fine, we've got a normal day-night rhythm, and then boom, when a conflict happens, the vibration of your brain it changes and so the vibration in the in the in the psyche the experience in the brain in the organ everything changes that's the same goes for when we have a constellation we've got two different frequencies in the brain which causes a certain expression of the behavior and so all of the the universal principles can be illustrated through the biological laws and you know just by understanding how you know how does one live a moral life you know what is moral moral is what is in alignment with how nature wants it to be. And so when we violate nature, when we, you know, violate the normal birthing process, like I've talked about a bunch of times because I'm very passionate about that topic, mm -hmm. when you violate the, the normal birthing process- Like cutting the cord and shit? Yeah, you've done something immoral. You've gone away mm -hmm. from nature. And so when they're, yes. when that happens, there's a consequence. Every time you go against what the biology has uh, determined, there's going to be some type of biological consequence you know and you experience that through cause and effect and it's like oh here's the cause you know we separated this baby from its mother so it couldn't smell it it could you know and she felt very separated and so now here the cause and the adaptation so the biology it's not it's never a punishment it's only um, cause and effect. It's only this is how the biology responds to something that happens. Um, and so that is how we can, you know, tie every, you know, the principle of mentalism, all is mind, the body is materialized consciousness. And this is, you know, how, how the how our, our system works. And so by understanding what are the laws, and how can I work more intelligently within them? Yeah, yeah. And isn't there a gender principle operating as well with like yes. the sides Always. of your body? Can you can you share a little about that? Yeah, so the gender principle you can see in the cerebral cortex. And so the, the left side of the brain um, controls the level of estrogen and the right side of the brain controls the level of testosterone. And so when we have, when we shift our, when we have certain conflicts, it shifts our level of estrogen or testosterone causing someone to, instead of expressing themselves as their, their, their biological nature, they can shift that. Because if a woman has a sexual conflict, so she doesn't feel safe in her sexuality, a right-handed woman, because the body is wired in a different way if you're right-handed versus being left-handed. So when a right-handed woman has a sexual conflict, and so, you know, if she was violated, if she was abused in some way, if she saw something that she, you know, of a sexual nature that she wasn't prepared to see, so children being exposed to, you know, all manner of stuff on the internet, uh, you know, of a sexual nature, what happens is she has a sexual conflict that affects the left side of her brain, her estrogen goes down and she starts to see the world. So, you know, 
you'll hear stories of, oh, yeah, she was all girly one day and then she turned into a tomboy. You know, so what, the, what that indicates is like, we kind of want to look at what happened to her. Did she see something she shouldn't have seen? Did she see something that shocked her sexually? Did something happen? Because that is what causes a girl to see things more from the perspective of a boy and to be interested. It changes your, what you're interested in. And so, yes, mm -hmm. the principle of gender is extremely important in looking at, you know, how the biology, you know, how you're perceiving your reality, also the sides of the body. Um, if you are right-handed, your dominant side is related to your partner. And so anyone who isn't your mother or child, so this could be your father, your sibling, a coworker, and then the left side, the non-dominant side is your mother child. It's your nurturing side. So think of, you know, so a right dominant person naturally would hold their baby on their left side mm -hmm. so that their dominant yeah. hand is free to do yeah. things. And so that is, you know, so your non-dominant side is your nurturing mother child side. And this also applies uh, for men. Their non-dominant side is their mother child side. Which is really cool because you can say, you know, someone comes in and they say, oh, I've got a you know, terrible, stiff and sore shoulder. The shoulder is just killing me. And it's like, OK, mm -hmm. did you have an injury? Because there are a few exceptions to, you know, biological uh, special programs being the cause of symptoms. Obviously, something like an injury. If you injure your shoulder, um, there's not necessarily a conflict with that. There's an injury that's now in the healing. Now, or if you um, have an overt poisoning. So if you drink some Drano and you're vomiting and having diarrhea, you know, it's not because you're having uh, a, a conceptual conflict. It's because you in ingested poison. And then also if you have a severe nutritional deficiency, that's another thing that can cause, you know, symptoms in the body that's not necessarily mm -hmm. because there was a conflict that originated it. Um, but if your left shoulder, so let's say a man is having a left shoulder chronic pain that just keeps going and he can't figure it out and he doesn't know why it's there it's like okay are you right or left-handed if he's left-handed his left side is his partner side and so we have to look at you know what's going on with your spouse what's going on with your girlfriend what's going on with your you know your co-worker your sibling where are you having a relationship self-devaluation conflict so again the area of the body pinpoints helps us to figure out what type of conflict, and then we can even figure out who it's with based on the side of the body it shows up on. That's so cool. So yeah, actually, <laughs> that's right on the money. Uh, the woman I'm with right now has an issue with her shoulder because, yeah, there's still some unresolved issues with her ex-partner, whatever. But, uh, yeah, that's really interesting. Um, how much time we got, by the way? We're coming up on a uh, twenty. Do you have? Do you have? A, I have a few more questions. Are you good for yeah, time? Yeah, we can keep going. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, gosh, first, sorry, Liz. Yeah, I have so I many different thoughts popping you know. in my head. Yeah, yeah. I'll make sure you have a chance, Derek. <laughs> yeah. No I, um, okay. So, so that's shit for a while. So I know what's so. up. Yeah. Do you, go <laughs> ahead, Derek. Why don't you go now? Are you sure? Yeah. All right. So, personal question, if you don't mind me asking. Yeah. Go for it. And respects to all you wonderful chiropractors out there. I'm sure you guys have had, you know, oh, you're not a real doctor type of criticism. Other, you know, like people with MDs, I mean, whatever kind of, you know, prefixed, you know, names before their doctor, whatever the hell, might look down upon you and be like, oh, what do you know about, you know, what I, you know, all this jazz. Um, I want to know if you've had these issues and how you've been able to kind of either sidestep them or bring reason to them. And are you familiar with my, you know, hey, uh, he's in Southern California too, J Dr. John Bergman. No, I'm not familiar. What? He's a cool chiropractor and he cracks me up all the time. He's a, got a great laugh, personality, and super great information with, you know, you know, diagrams, uh, references, and, you know, peer reviewed studies, all these studies that, you know, people, oh, where's your proof and all this shit. There it is like, why are people so lazy to, you know, you know, Hey, Google is not your friend with, you know, looking up this stuff that's been censored the fuck over. But, uh, back to my original question, like what's kind of been, you know, whatever kind of mental or stature tug of war with, you know, your, you know, colleagues or whoever in that medical world. Well, I mean, the, the, one of the things I find so funny, I mean, I don't even take it seriously simply because it's just ridiculous because um, there was a whole committee. So the, the American Medical Association had this committee on quackery where they, you know, paid 
television programs to like basically shit talk chiropractors and other holistic doctors so that so that they would paint this picture and they they even again the committee on quackery there so when a person says oh you're a chiropractor you're a quack you know that that person is a non-thinker that they that idea was implanted in their brain from this committee that says we need to kind of get people you know feeling like this is pseudoscience this is fake this isn't you know real and and so because I know that people are so susceptible to that programming, you know, it's simply, it's just bad information. And, you know, if a person wants to, you know, if you're committed to allopathic doctors being the only ones who know anything about the human body, I'm not interested in trying to convince you otherwise. I mean, do your thing, think what you think, you know, and your life will bear the results of whatever you believe to be mm-hmm. true. And so whether that's good or bad, you're the mm-hmm. only one who's going to reap those consequences. And so, you know, I don't really spend too much time concerning myself with it. There's, you know, I'll get hilarious comments on social media. Oh, you're a chiropractor. Oh, what do you know? Da, 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 da. And I mean, even so, like even in the chiropractic world, I see things extremely different than I did when I practiced chiropractic. Knowing the five biological laws of Germany medicine, I think a lot of what I learned in chiropractic school was not accurate, you know? And so even more so if I was in medical school that it's like, but to be able to come to terms with like, you know what, I spent a lot of years of my life. I invested a lot of money, a lot of, you know, what I thought was, this is the, you know, this is the the best information about health. And I realized, you know, I was cheated. I was. I didn't learn mm-hmm. this map. They and they. They should have taught me this map. And this is why every everyone who's in any health professional, everyone should be turning on the medical board. We should be turning on the the people who have suppressed this information, because yeah. they are culpable. In I mean, you. It wouldn't be an exaggeration to call it a genocide. People dying because they do not know why this map, this map gives you so much information about why disease happens and so much death and suffering and sickness can be avoided. If every family doctor, if everyone who has practiced any form of medicine for the last 40 years should have been doing it on this basis. Yeah. Before, but what's the second or third common, you know, cause of death? At least in Me- medical um, intervention. <laughs> it can be avoided, totally. like you're saying. That's all I'm going to say, right? Yeah. Yep. So this is a good a good segue to just talk more about how <laughs> this, <you>. this <laughs> um, knowledge is being uh, suppressed, and it is occulted knowledge, and um, the some of the the reasons for that from your point of view and. What are your thoughts? Yeah, Dr. Hammer, he, he, in 1981, he correlated this, his thesis, and he submitted it to the University of Tübingen, and they would not look at it. They, they, behind closed doors, he later got confirmation that they looked at it, and they validated it, and they verified it, but to this day, there's still, um, I think, like a suit of something that, or against them. I heard this recently that I was trying to find, you know, the the data on it that they pay like ten thousand um, dollars a year, um, or you know, German mark equivalent of ten thousand dollars a year for the fact that they have not looked at this thesis. They have not analyzed it because, again, you you either look at this and say. This is accurate. This represents our best knowledge. And Dr. Hammer, he had multiple university level verification. So what he would do is he'd come into the university. And so the the university is kind of like the the highest level in medicine, because this is where all of the medical doctors who are going to go out into the world, this is where they're being taught. And so these medical universities are kind of the highest level. So he'd come in and there'd be a panel of these, you know, top level university doctors and Dr. Hammer would be there and there'd be like eight different cases and there'd be the CT brain scan, the patient file. I don't know, you know, maybe sometimes the patient would be there, but basically the whole work for Dr. Hammer was to show that his five biological laws were being proved in this case, that there was a conflict shot, that the per- shock that the person experienced, that there's an impact in their brain in a specific area and the disease that they're dealing with, that it all correlates according to his map. And he got this university, multiple universities said, yes, this is the way that it worked. And he go in there and it would be amazing. There's this great story of, um, 
called the Acts of Trnava. So this was the University of Trnava, where he's going in and, and doing one of these verifications. And he saw, based on the person's, the man's brain scan, that he had to have had what's called an attack against the, the chest, attack against the heart conflict, based on the impact in the brain and what was going on with the organ. He, he knew that this conflict had to be there. And so he's asking, you know, the patient was there in this case, and so he's questioning the patient, you know, did you ever, you know, have someone in your family who had a heart attack? Did you ever, you know, be, you know, were you ever afraid of having a heart attack? All of these questions, questions for hours, you know, he goes on over an hour and all the university doctors are like, well, maybe, maybe your theory isn't always right. Maybe there isn't always a conflict. And so Homer goes into the next hour and he's like, well, did you ever have a dog that had a heart issue? And all of a sudden he, the man who's being questioned. So this is the man who's got the brain scan, who Homer sees something on the brain scan that indicates something about a conflict this man had. The man doesn't remember. The university doctors are like, it's not there because he doesn't remember. But Hammer knows because these are laws. These are biological laws, which means they're always consistent, which, which means that this circle can't be in this portion of the brain if this man did not experience mm -hmm. a certain type mm -hmm. of shocking conflict of an attack against the chest. And so when Dr. Hammer asked him, you know, did you ever have a dog that had a heart issue? All of a sudden, the man remembers this story. And the story is, you know, 20 year, some years ago, he was living, you know, in a, in a small town, I'm assuming somewhere in Germany, and there was a, a festival. And the festival was they, like, they roast a goose for this festival, whatever this mm -hmm. festival is. And um, in the evening, the man hears his dog barking. And he goes out to see what the commotion is, what the dog is barking about, and he sees that there's a goose thief. So someone is coming to this guy's house to steal his goose because this big holiday is happening and you need a goose. And so this guy is getting his goose stolen. He goes uh -huh. out there and to, you know, to confront the goose thief, and the goose thief turns around and hits him in the chest with an axe. Ah. Uh. So this is the attack. This is the. I mean, and you think. If you were ever in your whole life hit in the chest with an axe, you think that you'd remember you'd that. You'd remember, but, right. But a traumatic circumstance gets suppressed by the psyche. And so a man mm -hmm. can be asking you for over an hour, have you ever had an attack against your chest? Anything scary that happened to your chest, to your heart? And you're like, no, I don't, I don't know. I have no idea. And then, you know, he mentions a dog and somehow your psyche pulls out the dog barking and makes the connection. The memory. And so that, and so, I mean, it was just this amazing story. And uh, Dr. Hammer would tell the story at his lecture to say if the if the patient doesn't remember or says oh, I didn't have and this is a thing that will happen you know often when I'm sharing on social media mm -hmm. connections between conflicts and symptoms they'll say I never had that that I never had that conflict German new medicine it doesn't make any sense because that never happened to me and it's like are you sure <laughs> because if you're having the symptom based yeah. on this biological law this means that you did have the conflict, whether you remember or recognize it or not, it's probably suppressed. It probably is something that isn't coming to your conscious mind mm -hmm. right away. But if you pulled the thread, you would be able to see, oh, this is what happened. And so that's kind of, you know, part of this detective work, part of this, like figuring out the mystery. When did this start? What is it that happened when you're working with mm -hmm. a tool like this, when you're working with a map that's always consistent, Hammer would not put it in his system if it wasn't consistent every single time. And yeah. so you know, that that's one of the things that we that German engineering, <laughs> that German mind, right. says, oh, this that is right. how it has to be very specific. So interesting. So if someone came comes into your practice and, you, you know, you do this process of figuring it out, then what is an example of your prescription or your treatment, you know, that you would advise? Yeah, my personal approach is they have to learn the map themselves. <laughs> you know, I want you to learn the map because anything I tell you, anything I don't give a prescription, I don't say, you know, I say, learn the map. Let's learn how this works. I teach a class every Monday called the language mm -hmm. of adaptation. So you learn how does my tissue respond? And then we, you know, we can go to work at asking questions, getting better at getting in touch mm -hmm. with your intuition um, and your instinct because most conflicts are resolved through intuition and instinct, things you do mm -hmm. naturally. And so my work is in helping you to get in tune with your instinct, with your intuition, ask yourself good questions. 
when is the first time I ever felt this? You know, what was going on in my life at the time? Who was I around? I mean, you start asking yourself these basic questions, you're going to get good at pulling the thread. And so that's the thing is I want people to be equipped to use and apply this wisdom in their everyday life. I don't want you to come to me and have me figure out your problems or give you a prescription. That mm-hmm. is not, you know, teach a man to fish. That is yeah. what I'm into. It's like, let me show you. This is the map. This is where you look. These are the questions. This is how you get in tune. You know, I really want people to get in tune with themselves. Quiet the mind. Meditate. Like, clear out some of this space. Pay attention. My A lot of my work um, revolves around conscious awareness. Are you even aware of the thoughts you think all day? Are you even aware yeah. of what keeps coming up for you, of what is unresolved, of how you think about everything in your life? And so that's where I point people is back to themselves, to the map, to learning. And so that's the essence mm-hmm. of like what my practice now is, is simply teaching yeah. people how to understand their body, you know, to develop confidence, you know, and faith. So a lot of times mm-hmm. people just, if, you, if you've been told, oh, well, you have an autoimmune condition, your body just attacks itself. That is undermining. Mm-hmm. How can you have faith in your body if you think your body is attacking right, itself? Right. You know, so we have to unlearn a lot of what we've learned and start mm-hmm. to really develop this confidence that my body does know what it's doing, everything it's ever done has been for my benefit. And there, you know, if I can just calm down and see and make these connections and resolve, what in my life is still unresolved? Who do I need Mm -hmm. to create a boundary with? Who do I need to kick out? Who do I need to go see? What job do I need to quit? It's going to, it's forcing you to evolve. And you're like, where have you halted your evolution? You know, you've mentioned several times about medication. Medication halts evolution because it allows you to not change your situation, to not leave that environment. Allows you to suppress and just kind of cope where you are rather than actually making the changes. And that's the thing. Some people are resistant to making the changes they would need to make in order for their conflict to resolve. You know, they don't want their life to change that much. And so, you know, if you're not willing to do that, this path of actually healing may not be what, you know, is available to you in this lifetime if you're not willing to make those changes. Yeah, that's huge what you're describing there. Because it, the ultimately, it's not just about taking a pill and continuing the same old, same old. It's really about evaluating your your very lifestyle and being willing to take action. You know, make real changes at the fundamental level where you're in the the, the fundamental conflicts. Yeah. You know, like could be with your job experience or a partner or you know whatever. That's that's huge. So so how do you? Um, is there a, a way that, you know, how would you see the best, um, I guess, harmonious way of interacting with the Western medicine, you know? Yeah, I mean, so there are situations where conventional Western medicine is very helpful, you know, and so that, mm-hmm. but first you have to understand the role that it plays, you know, and so mm-hmm. that is in a mechanical issue, <laughs> you know, do I need to, you know, find a surgeon to cut out something specifically because, You know, Mm -hmm. either it's an adaptation that I just don't like anymore, it's aesthetically bothering me, you know, and why Mm -hmm. am I doing it? So when you understand Mm -hmm. why you're employing certain, Mm -hmm. um, you know, medical interventions, you can do it with a completely sound mind. You know, sometimes Mm -hmm. people will, you know, go the route of having a tooth pulled because they've had a bite Mm -hmm. conflict for years and years and years, Mm -hmm. and it hurts so bad, it's causing a problem. It's like, you know what, I'm going to have this tooth Mm -hmm. removed simply because I know that this conflict isn't resolved yet. It's still ongoing and the healing phase is just too intense. You know, making a sound, you know, intelligent choice like that, it makes a lot of sense. But when you know why you're doing it, if you think that, you know, it's because you don't brush enough and it's just bacteria and you need to, you know, sanitize your mouth with uh, Listerine five times a day, that's not why your tooth decayed. You're not getting to the point. And so we want to cause of factors. Yeah. Utilize the medical care when necessary, but get to the point, which is the conflict. So we can, right. you know, you can utilize it. Hammer even said there are certain health adaptations like in the pancreas or the thyroid. If you've had that conflict for years, you know, and your, your thyroid no longer because you've been building up and breaking down tissue, build up, break down, build up, break down. Mm-hmm. You know, your body can run that program a certain number of times before there's no longer enough tissue to produce right. uh, pancreatic juices or th- thyroid hormone. And so in that case, you know, you would wisely intervene with medical supplementation mm-hmm. of those um, things that no longer mm-hmm. your body is able to produce. That makes sense. And so we only use it in situations where it makes biologically sound sense given the context mm-hmm. of the conflicts. And so, uh, you know, when a person 
is in a situation where they've had even like a, you know, a, a cancer, you know, a, a breast adaptation. It's like, okay, if a part of you is afraid of it, if you, you know, uh, having it, it removed can be the best path. I always, mm -hmm. I always advise people, what is the path of most peace? And because again, mm -hmm. we've been raised in the allopathic model, we've been raised in the conventional model. There's often a part of the mind that feels irresponsible or that it's doing something wrong or bad if you don't utilize the medical care. And so I've become very just, you know, guiding the person, what's the path of most peace? What what would bring you? Is getting the scan going to give you peace? Is having the surgery going to give you peace? I mean, even in cases where people, I mean, I don't agree with, I would never take chemotherapy, but if a person believes in it, the mentalism, the power of the mind, the ability, if I believe in something mm -hmm. so much, if I've been mm -hmm. told that the only way you're going to survive this is the chemo, go ahead, give it a go. I mean, it's your mm -hmm. body. It's your life. What makes the most sense to you? What's going to bring you the most peace is not necessarily going to be what brings me the most peace, but you are what matters in this equation. It's about you. You are the one that is determining what happens next. And so feeling yeah. confident and comfortable and not, and the biggest thing is getting out of any mental division. The conflicts. Got, yeah. Yeah. If you've got split energy about it, get all on board with something. That's so, so profound. I, I can relate to that. Um, Respect that so, free will, yeah. That's, that's great. Yeah. You know, and I, I think, um, you know, for example, like the tooth thing, you know, let's say it's determined the tooth is cracked and blah, blah, and you take the tooth out. And then is there a follow-up to that when you're thinking through this model? Like, okay, what was that bite conflict? How do I go back so that I don't lose another tooth, for example? Like, is there... Yeah part two to this process. It's, yeah. So yeah, if you're having some type of intervention and you know that this is like an emergency thing, but I still, you still need to resolve the conflict. You still need mm -hmm. to figure out who you want to bite, why you can't bite them. You know, do you need to speak your mind? Do you need to set a boundary? Do you need to, you know, move across the country so you don't see that person anymore? It's like, find a solution. Mm -hmm. And that is, you have to be very practical and very mm -hmm. solution oriented. If you, you know, opt for removal of surgery or something that doesn't get rid of the conflict. If you don't resolve, right it, it can come back again, depending on the tissue that you're dealing with, you know, it can come back again. And so that's where you have to resolve the conflict, find a practical solution. Um, and regardless of what medical stuff you're, you're doing as well. Yeah, super. That's super big, I think. Um, so gosh, Ooh, can Derek, I go? Have, yeah. Go <laughs> so I love that, you, you know, you touched upon how we're manifesting a lot of stuff going on just through the the mental uh, mindscape and how there's that placebo effect, you know, depending on the power of the mind and people's you know, level or degree of, of conviction. And these things aren't always necessarily considered with a lot of uh, rhetoric that you hear in like the truth seeker, speaker community. Sometimes they want to kind of throw a blanket statements. So, oh, it's all because of, you know, the, the quack scenes or whatever, right? When, uh, I don't know, there, there seems to be more to it than that. I mean, uh, what brought that to mind was when you talked about autoimmune diseases and that kind of stuff and how that can start earlier. And there's been like an uprise of that, of, you know, in recent decades and that, and we can correlate certain data points, whatever. But uh, yeah, as far as like, you know, since the dawning of the Rona, there has been, you know, a sudden rise in, I mean, even before there's been like a rise in like SIDS, whatever, blood clotting and like turbo cancer. Have you heard of this term? And just like, what is it? Mitochondriitis or something like that? Myocarditis or something. Yeah, thank you. So yeah, yeah I've been kind of just looking at this, observing, kind of like, all right, so what's the deal? You know, what's going on? Is it because of, you know, what I mentioned before with some of these egregores that have, you know, it's so fear based. And remember, fear is the mind killer. And when we, you know, we bring it back to the first hermetic principle, that is really going to set the stage through the first gate of our, you know, whole physical body and how we have, you know, that, you know, proper inner commune with it. As you mentioned before, Melissa, how's our self-talk going on all that jazz, you know? So I'm just curious as, as to how these, you know, dynamics and side effects of whatever type of pharmaceutical stuff that people are taking, 
how is that playing into the dynamic of the new German <clears throat> model and uh, way of diagnosing, you know, all the, all these uh, things? I guess. Yeah, this is a very interesting uh, subject, especially in the realm of like, you know, terrain theory and this idea that, um, you know, it's some type of poisoning. And so, yes, there can be overt poisons that cause disruption of physiological processes in the body. So there, that does exist. However, a lot of things that have been labeled as poisoning. So, for example, I used to think that autism was the direct effect of poisoning. I, and I thought that vaccines were the poison that caused autism. However, I know a lot of people who've had vaccines that don't have autism. And then I also know people who never gave their child the vaccine and their child is expressing autism. And so that for me was really confusing when I was in that old model where I was certain that it was the vaccine that caused this, you know, this thing called autism. But when I understood the five biological laws and that it's a combination of a scare fright conflict in the larynx relay and then a territorial anger conflict in the uh, stomach bile duct relay, it was like, oh, so this is how. So when the person has the constellation, that's what causes the manifestation of autism and you can have that whether or not so a vaccine certainly could cause that type of conflict constellation but other events can as well now with the last several years and the vaccine and all of the things that have you know weird bizarre symptoms i i hesitate to say oh it's definitely causing all of these things because i look more at the individual basis what's going on with this individual what happened to them did they have a conflict? And there is actually an objective standard we would be able to use. So for the people who are really into terrain theory and they think they, they kind of label everything as a detox response. They think that diarrhea, that's a detox response and a rash. Oh, that's a detox response and acne. Well, that's a detox response. GNM looks at it as acne is a feeling attacked or feeling soiled conflict adaptation of the dermis. A rash is a cerebral cortex ectodermal adaptation due to a separation conflict. Diarrhea is an indigestible morsel conflict with an aspect of stuckness. So each of these symptoms has a very specific, rather than labeling it with detox response, which to me, I used to think that too, but now it just isn't specific enough. It doesn't really get to like, what is detoxing and why? But GNM and the map makes much more sense to me. Now, when it comes to the last several years and bizarre things and turbo cancers and myocarditis and all of that, what we need to do to determine is to do a brain scan. So on a bunch of people, and this is like the future, we, we need dollars and researchers behind the five biological laws doing you know, large scale research, it just hasn't been done because of the suppression, because of the way that this, you know, Dr. Hammer's discoveries have been not allowed to make it to the mainstream because they're so disruptive. Um, and if you did a brain scan, we'd be able to see if there's an impact in the brain in that specific area and the person is expressing, you know, the symptom myocarditis or, you know, whatever symptoms, if the impact's in the brain, we know it was a conflict. If the symptom is there, but there's no impact in the brain, we can say for certain Certain, this is a toxic poisoning response. Ooh, the body was poisoned. This tissue was poisoned. There's a disruption in the physiology of this organ because of the introduction of the poison. And that would be a valid, like a scientific way to go about it. Otherwise, we're just guessing. Because if we don't have the brain scan, we don't know if it was a conflict shock with a biological program that was activated in the brain, or if it was an exogenous poison that got into the body and disrupted the physiology at that location. Mm -hmm. Wow. So these brain scans that you're talking about, are is there a special training needed, you know, to identify or notice those disruptions? Yes. And unfortunately, there are very few people that even know how to do it. Um, I haven't mm -hmm. had the training. We're hoping that there will be a training available in, in, you know, hopefully not too long from now so that we can develop more, you know, have more people that have this knowledge. You know, it's a very specialized skill. And when I was in chiropractic school, we did uh, multiple quarters of radiology. And it is, I mean, to look at an x-ray, mm -hmm. to look at, you know, soft tissue radiology, to see, you know, things, it's like, it's kind of mm -hmm. very, it's very, very difficult. And so it's a highly mm -hmm. specialized skill that takes yeah. years and years and years to be able to see and to recognize. And so, um, yes, there are few people um, that are have the capacity to read it from the German new medicine perspective, but it is, there is actually, if you guys have heard of Stefan, Dr. Stefan Lanka, so he's the German virologist who has debunked germ theory and virology. And he is trying to come up with um, a uh, kind of like a, another 
another way to do what the brain scan does, what the CT brain scan does, you know, and, and, you know, we could have technology that could even do the reading rather than having a person visually look at it. So with technology, very cool things are uh, possible. It's just, we're not there yet, unfortunately, but we do know that this does exist and there is objective because that's the thing. This is mm-hmm. the thing that takes Dr. Hammer's work out of the realm of like woo woo mind body psychosomatics. It's been around for a really long time that brings it into the, the realm of validated objective, physical, biological science. Yeah. And so the, the brain scan is absolutely paramount for, uh, you know, so a medical doctor who's very, you know, that they consider themselves very research-based, scientific, you have to start considering the brain scan, the psyche brain organ correlation, and, uh, and look at why are these impacts in the brain? Why is the impact get curious, you know, get out of your dogma, get out of your, you know, the paradigm, the way you've always seen it, the thing that has, you've been teaching for years, you have to be humble enough to say, listen, maybe I, maybe I've been limited in my perspective. If there's always an impact in this area of the brain, and that person always has a certain type of cancer, and they always had a certain type of emotional experience, and those things are always there every single time, every single time, every single time, maybe this is this should be the basis of the medicine that i'm practicing rather than the idea that something's going wrong in the body and so you know it takes humility it takes curiosity it takes willingness to exit the matrix and you know who's willing to do that not everyone but there are a growing number <laughs> yeah and the, and spreading this information i think is a really important part of bringing more people into this um, certainly open mind and awakening. Um, and, and so what do you see as, as like the possibilities for our world, you know, um, if more and more people learn this, if, if you have the majority who are raised understanding these biological laws, like what's the possibilities for our future as a species? Yeah, it changes everything. It changes the way that we conceive children, parent children, organize society. I mean, Dr. Homer, he wrote an entire um, kind of constitution for how society, because there there are heavy political aspects of this work, because the way that, you know, the wage slave, slave of the system, slave of the government, it doesn't work. It doesn't work because, again, if a, if a mother has to go to work to pay her tax, you know, it's like all of this stuff, it's just how can she do it? You can't raise a family and be there for them and support them in all the things that they need. We'd have, you know, closer knit communities. We'd have people supporting each other. We'd have, you know, uh, everything about how we raise and do family would be built around, um, you know, supporting the mothers, supporting the, the ones that are bringing life. We'd have children much younger, you know, so people wouldn't be so focused on building careers and going to school because even intellectual, higher intellectual pursuits, you know, those are highly prized in our modern society. Where did you go to college? Oh, what's your degree? And what is your this? That is non-biological. You know, that Mm -hmm. is an indication of someone who's been emotionally stunted and has intellectually developed, but not biologically developed. A woman, you know, pausing her fertility for all of her, you know, twenties is Mm non-biological. So people would be having Mm -hmm. more children, having them younger, raising them in communities, doing more things, you know, and I, and I do think that there is a, you know, cool way to, to blend modernity and the cool things that the human mind has developed in technology. And like, so there's cool aspects of it, but you know, if it starts to dominate us, obviously that takes it too far. But I do think that the creative mind that's in tune with nature, in tune with biology, will start utilizing it all in a way that makes sense. And so there's amazing implications for what this holds for the future. And and it is, it's growing. It's becoming the egregore. This is, this knowledge is taking hold. You know, I see it, I see it growing. I, you know, when I first came across it, there was like nothing about it. And that's why I was like, I knew I was going to be a part of sharing this on a wide scale because I can't talk about this enough. I'm, you know, people ask me to do podcasts. Absolutely. Because if one more person gets on this train and understands how their biology works and has freedom from fear and can raise their children with this map, you know, I'm so passionate about that because it is, I think that that is how we save humanity. That is how, you know, we improve the health and the well being and the peace of mind and the ease and the soul of of, of the human, because, yeah. you know, we need this knowledge, not having this knowledge puts you at a great disadvantage in life. Oh, yeah. And and the piece about learning uh, how to resolve conflicts, 
right? If this uh, integral part of this knowledge, and that is really what the world needs, uh, you know, so badly. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. So yes, yeah, we totally. are, we are winding down a little bit. So yeah, I still we, got a question or two. Yeah, I knew you would. <laughs> so go ahead, Derek. Always. It's never enough, but <laughs> yeah, Melissa, like, yeah, thank you so much. You brought up so many great points and you, you're spot on with so much of what I resonate with and what I've, you know, studied and confirmed, you know, reference after reference. And yeah, my awakening journey kind of was hand in hand with a lot of stuff. But one of them was like a health crisis where I had eczema and stuff. And I, I didn't know these things to like look into my past. And like, it was a time I was married to a, a beautiful Tahit French Tahitian woman I moved to Paris and all this stuff and, and yeah, getting, you know, ripped away from the homeland or whatever. Like I didn't really always factor these, you know, stressful things in or you kind of play it off like, ah, you know, it ain't nothing or you kind of numb it with, you know, other substances and all, all this stuff. But um, my question real quick, because this one's a doozy and it's just, it's a real shame how the world has been so divided with, you know, the medical, the cult of the medics and all this stuff. And going back to what you were saying, and it's unfortunate how this is still being played out today of the whole quackery of, you know, this allopathic takeover of the medical realm. And this is done, you know, you know, over a century ago, a la, you know, Rockefeller medicine men, and even like a little bit before that, in other countries, right? And even, you know, like the founder of, you know, if you guys understand what the word vaccine means, it, it's from the word vaca, which is, means cow, and Edward, uh, someone, uh, uh, Jenner, he, he all made that up. But anyways, what I want to, you know, not to get into detail too much, but uh, it's just interesting. You break down etymologically certain things in the historicity of all these cover-ups, but uh, it just, you know, gives a bigger picture towards the disharmony of the caduceus, you know, the medical um, s symbol, right? The two snakes, you know, kind of sim symbolizing our DNA in a sense. And if you notice in certain pharmacies now, there's only one snake on one side of that, you know, pole. And that's uh, kind of like an occultic uh, mockery of how things have been imbalanced towards the allopathic way of the medical world. We did a talk with Ashley Weiss. I kind of threw that in there in, in the intro, just like real quick on, on the sly. If folks understand that shit, they would be like, yeah, that's what's up. But uh, <clears throat> I see, uh, in a sense, in regards to like the law of uh, gender, the principle of gender, you know, like allopathic is more like the, the masculine side and, and the homeopathic is more like the feminine side. And you know, humanity has been way too much, has had way too much yang up in that thing for too long. And it sucks that, you know, the, that feminine, that true divine care and the non-aggression principle, you know, how much medication is over aggressive on our bodies and that kind of stuff. When there's so many homeopathy, that homeopathy works wonders. The woman I'm with right now, she gave birth to 9,000 women or 9,000 well, yeah, women, but uh, that gave birth to babies in this world. You know, she's been doing this for like 30 years and she gave birth to three uh, children of her own and she never felt any pain because she went through the homeopathy, you know, th these protocols that are not, you know, practiced in a lot of Western medicine, unfortunately. And it's a real shame that people have suffered so much for whatever reason. And it seems to be the crux of what I'm getting at with all this is that there's like this moral ambiguity with stuff and what is deemed right and correct and, you know, non uh, aggressive or, you know, it's non-threatening and how many people are not held accountable for the deaths of whatever malpractice or overdosage or bad prescriptions, whatever the case be, you know, and that's not to say, you know, I've been more on the negative side of, of these people. But, you know, like you said, these people, you know, have helped so many countless people through whatever ailments uh, that, you know, that the homeopathic side just, you know, it can't. So to find that divine union of these two, like how can we, you know, bridge these gaps 
and really pave the road for the future. So we don't have, you know, uh, you know, the cause of death, you know, being so high for, you know, people in hospitals and, and that kind of stuff, right? Yeah, that was I mean, a long question, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. The inversion system, I mean, even if you look at the peace sign, the peace sign, if you look mm. at it, it's the it's the inverted, you know, so when you look at it. And I you saw your slide it, you turn, on this. Yeah, you turn place. it face yeah. up and it's like hands up to the sky and you even feel different when you look at down to the ground, head down, death versus life, you know, and so that is the inversion system is let's turn everything around. Let's turn it upside down. And yes, there is you know, a way to harmonize and to use, you know, the good in, you know, the good in the medical system. Uh, but it, again, it starts with honesty and looking at, at, at this other system, you know, because the, the primary, the fundamental premise of allopathic medicine is that there's something gone wrong. And that is a violation of the fifth biological law, which is nature doesn't do anything that's wrong. There's a lack of questioning and asking why does this make sense why did nature build this why did nature build this because when you learn you know why is there why is there fungus in the woods why are the why are these mushrooms here well they're breaking down you know tissue dead and decaying matter that's being recycled back into the earth so why if someone's having fungus in their body if they've got candida it's because it's recycling it's breaking down tissue that's no longer needed and so instead of saying this is something to fight against why is this bacteria here you know, why is bacteria in the body? Oh, well, it's bad and it's doing, you know, it's causing an infection. No, the bacteria is serving a purpose. The fourth biological law is the ontogenetic system of microbes, that every microbe serves a perfect purpose. It's like a microsurgeon, you know, and so we have to recognize what the microsurgeon is doing and why it's there and what its function and purpose is. And so that can't happen until we have a reformation in medicine and where the, the you know, the medical doctors and some honest people actually look at Dr. Hammer's thesis, actually look at how this would change, in, you know, and, and that's the thing is I hope that it happens, but, you know, in our lifetime, we just have to take responsibility for ourselves. You know, it's got to be a grassroots thing because it doesn't seem like it's going to come from the top down anytime soon. And so individuals learning how their body works, individuals, you know, um, that it's, it's going to build to the point where it's going to be inevitable that the system will crumble. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what is your best, I guess, tips for people going forward? You know, you talked about education and understanding these principles, learning how their body works, right? So um, any other thoughts about what you would advise people to do um, to go forward? Pay attention. Pay attention to your body. Pay attention to your symptoms. Pay attention to when you have a sore throat, when you, next time you sneeze, what were you annoyed about <laughs> when you have a sore throat? What couldn't you swallow when you have a pimple? How did you feel soiled or attacked right there at that spot? You know, I've got just a little tiny one that's healing here because my dogs are so loving, but sometimes they will just slap the, the wettest, just nastiest, just like kiss right on my, and I will get a little pimple there because I felt ugh, dirtied. I felt gross, you know, and this is something I've worked on a bunch and I, I can, if I can expect it, you know, and they kiss me and I allow it, but if I'm caught off guard, I will get a little pimple. And so that's how it works. You pay attention to your symptoms. You pay attention and you say, oh, what does German New Medicine say? Let me look this up. Let me, you know, check out my YouTube channel. Um, look at my blog. I've got a lot of resources, books and, you know, courses and things to study so that you can start, you just have to start learning and paying attention to it. You know, if you're feeling really itchy somewhere, it's like, ooh, itching, that comes during the healing phase after a separation conflict. If you have a rash, if you have a, you know, like you just start to pay attention to what your body is telling you and you decode it and you figure out what is the source of this from the German New Medicine map. And then you try to put the pieces together and you just keep doing that until it makes perfect sense to you and you see it and you'll start to see it everywhere. Mm -hmm. So let's say, for example, you know, you become aware of the cause of the, the pimple, then what do what you do, do next? Nothing. Well, you, Just allow you it. See, yeah, yeah, there's nothing to do. It's already done. I had the conflict. I resolved the conflict and the symptoms here. There's nothing more to do. All I need to do is pay attention so that I can, you know, try to do my best to avoid having that conflict again. You know, and so, and that's just paying attention to my environment, you know, like when does my dog catch me off guard and slobber on my face? It's like, if I paid a little more attention, if I was a little more aware of my surroundings, I could either prevent that or welcome the kiss, you know, without being caught off guard by it, you know? And so once the symptom happens, 
most of the time the conflict's already resolved and you're just now learning a little bit of something about yourself. Oh, that's how I perceive that. You know, oh, I wanted to bite your head off when you said that and I held back. That's why my tooth is aching right now. And so at this point, once the pain is already there, a lot of times there's nothing to do other than connect the dots, pay attention, and trust that my body is now in the repair phase. Great, great. Word. And I'll add on just a solution because, you know, respects to Brandon Spencer in regards to my yachts, trying to live your life as light as a feather, just and it doesn't mean, you know, going through life, you know, la di da, rose colored glasses, carefree kind of shit. It's actually going through that hardcore alchemy, especially first and foremost. You get initiated into who you really are, get in touch with your hormones and, and your cells. Say, say, what's going on, guys? How you doing today? Are we good to go or what's up? And actually, you know, look at yourself, your, your shadow and implement everything that's been going on and alchemize that to whatever degree possible. And that really helps just your day-to-day -day operational stuff going on. And you're able to kind of deflect whatever is going on within the matrix while it's in and out of that stuff, like Mario West likes to say. Don't know if, if you're the third, but uh, yeah. Uh, real quick, because we're going to wrap this up. I know we kind of kept you a little longer than we, we wanted had planned, but uh Respects to some of the folks that I've learned quite a b bunch of uh, knowledge from, you know, experts, right? But they kind of got ostracized because of whatever, you know, things they said. But uh, Amanda Vollmer, yeah, you mentioned uh, Stefan uh, Lanke, Tom Cowan, Andy Kaufman, you've spoken with him a couple times, Kerry Madej, Made, uh, John Bergman, your fellow. Southern California chiropractor, <laughs> Rupert Sheldrake, you reference him. He's got some great uh, books and information and stuff on resonance and, you know, that kind of stuff. And uh, Dr. Horowitz, who gets into that kind of stuff, harmonics and sound frequency. Uh, Rudolf Steiner and rest in peace to Kerry Mullis, who was the inventor of the... What's that, you know? The, the, the test. Yeah. QR, whatever it is, Q. Who had some choice things to say about that, which got obscured. But do uh, you have anything to say about those uh, folks or what you know about them? Or No, I mean, I'm familiar with all of them. And they've all, you know, done a good job at, you know, sharing the truth over the last couple of years. But not necessarily German new medicine. They're, they're, they're paradigms are different a lot of them yeah it's more yeah. into the terrain theory type of stuff but uh mm -hmm. yeah it'd be great to find some kind of th synthesis where we get all these things wrapped up in something that you know is just you know embedded into the fabric of society and the institutions and all this mm -hmm. stuff but it sucks that we got the pharmaceutical pharmacia mafiosos and all that jazz but um just my one final question before you wrap it up is, um, are, are the wellness habits, eating healthy, drinking good water, exercise, those still have value, correct? From this Absolutely. I mean, when you're, you know, when you eat a bunch of fast food and you lay on the couch for a day, you don't feel as good than when you ate fresh food that you cooked yourself and you went on the walk, you know, and that alone lets you know that one is right for my body and one is wrong for my body simply because it's how I feel after I do it. You know, if you feel, and that's the thing is having a healthy lifestyle is inherently fulfilling. And so when you are, you know, choice, like choosing your nutrition consciously, it's better than choosing unconsciously. It's better than just eating a bunch of junk, you know? And so that is, it's all about, there is a role obviously for healthy living and lifestyle improvements, but it's, it's in how I feel. You know, but that doesn't mean I demonize, you know, if I, oh, I can't eat out at a restaurant because people will learn a bunch of health stuff and then get really neurotic and think that they can't eat here and they can't do this and they get really limited and they get afraid of eating, you know, anything that's not organic. And so it's like that becomes a conflict in and of itself. So we want to pay attention to how does it make me feel? You know, do I have better access to my instincts and intuition when I sleep enough and eat the right foods that feel good in my body and I exercise and I move and I meditate. It's like, I feel better when I do those things. I feel more in touch with my instincts and my intuition, whatever, you know, but if I eat a bunch of, you know, additives and, 
food that uh, disconnects me, that doesn't increase my connection to my instincts and intuition. And so that's where it's a very intuitive choice for yourself of what makes the most sense for me. You know, and so I don't believe in everyone has to live this lifestyle. You have to eat this. You can't eat this. You know, that's very dogmatic. That's not honoring the individual. So we have to honor the individual and what's going to help them to improve the way that they feel and access their own instincts and intuition. Yeah, excellent. So where do we get access to this information to study it? Please share more and just I'll give some more plugs for your your stuff. Yep. So yeah, my drmelissacell.com, you can go to my blog and getting started with uh, Germanic New Medicine. That uh, is really a great place. There's books listed. There's courses listed. Um, like I said, my YouTube channel is another great resource. I share a lot on Instagram, my Telegram channel. And so anywhere that you kind of access into my world, you'll be able to find tools for learning this this further. Excellent. Yeah. And we'll put some links in um, underneath the video. This is fascinating to me. I am oh, able yeah. to just keep learning more and more <laughs> about it and how to, you know, integrate this into my work, you know, in the world, the psychological mental health healing realm, because I, it, seems it seems very incomplete, incomplete without that. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Great. Thanks, guys. Thanks, thanks, guys. thanks for having me. Yeah. Thanks yeah, for your Melissa, time. Rock to thanks so much. Wow. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> You got this thing versed down to a T, it seems like. Yeah, yeah. Really, really great to mm -hmm. you know, learn from you and yeah, be in touch with you. I uh, appreciate it. All that, my little two cents, little penny for people's thoughts of just what I've been through. You know, most recently, I went on a 10 day fast and I do this uh, almost once a year. And that really helps me and it's helped other people really. You can get off and on different types of food and you can, you know, experiment with your body, get more in touch with your body. You're doing a lot of things without food in, in there. And you have, I said that horribly, but uh, <laughs> there's a different way that your body operates when it's not, you know, you know, like digesting all the time, right? And consuming mm -hmm. energy to do that. And I'm sure Melissa, you've done some research on this stuff. And uh, yeah, to just like reintroduce foods. And then if your people are trying to get off any kind of addictions to junk food or that kind of stuff, that is one of the best ways, uh, as far as my experience to to the, do that. So yeah, bon appetit, yeah, <laughs> or not, depending on if you're fasting. But. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, uh, we can drag on forever because I love this topic. But uh, anything else, thing else uh, you'd like to share with us, Melissa? Or I think that's complete. All right, cool. All right, yeah. Yeah, Thanks check again. out that Freedom Under Natural Law. Check out Melissa's uh, YouTube channel. We've got some great videos on there. You know, she breaks down a lot of stuff. Uh, yeah, a lot of topics. Do you have, do, you, do you have a website as well? DrMelissaSell.com, yeah. Okay, um, very good. good. Excellent. All righty. Well, thanks everybody for watching and uh, please check out Melissa's work and we'll catch you next time. Yeah, cheers.